Section 9 of The Theory of Moral Sentiments. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Andrus. The Theory of Moral Sentiments by Adam Smith. Part 2, Section 2, Chapter 1. Of merit and demerit, or of the objects of reward and punishment consisting of three parts. Section 2 of Justice and Beneficence. Chapter 1. Comparison of those two virtues. Actions of a beneficent tendency which proceed from proper motives seem alone to require a reward, because such alone are the approved objects of gratitude or excite the sympathetic gratitude of the spectator. Actions of a hurtful tendency, which proceed from the improper motives, seem alone to deserve punishment, because such alone are the approved objects of resentment, or excite the sympathetic resentment of the spectator. Beneficence is always free. It cannot be extorted by force. The mere want of it exposes to no punishment, because the mere want of beneficence tends to do no real positive evil. It may disappoint of the good which might reasonably have been expected, and upon that account it may justly excite dislike and disapprobation. It cannot, however, provoke any resentment which mankind will go along with. The man who does not recompense his benefactor when he has had it in his power, and when his benefactor needs his assistance, is no doubt guilty of the blackest ingratitude. The heart of every impartial spectator rejects all fellow feeling with the selfishness of his motives, and he is the proper object of the highest disapprobation. But still he does no positive hurt to anybody. He only does not do that good which in propriety he ought to have done. He is the object of hatred, a passion which is naturally excited by impropriety of sentiment and behavior, not of resentment a passion which is never properly called forth by, by actions which tend to do real and positive hurt to some particular person. His want of gratitude, therefore, cannot be punished. To oblige him by force to perform what ingratitude he ought to perform, and what every impartial spectator would approve of him for performing, would, if possible, be still more improper than his neglecting to perform it. His benefactor would dishonor himself if he attempted by violence to constrain him to gratitude, and it would be impertinent for any third person who is not the superior of either to intermeddle. But of all the duties of beneficence, those which gratitude recommends to us approach nearest to what is called a perfect and complete obligation. What friendship, what generosity, what charity would prompt us to do with universal approbation is still more free and can still less be extorted by force than the duties of gratitude. We talk of the debt of gratitude, not of charity or generosity, or even of friendship, when friendship is mere esteem and has not been enhanced and complicated with gratitude for good offices. Resentment seems to have been given us by nature for defense, and for defense only. It is the safeguard of justice and the security of innocence. It prompts us to beat off the mischief which is attempted to be done to us, and to retaliate that which is already done, that the offender may be made to repent of his injustice, and that others, through their fear of the like punishment, may be terrified from being guilty of the like offense. It must be reserved, therefore, for these purposes, nor can the spectator ever go along with it when it is exerted for any other. But the mere want of the beneficent virtues, though it may disappoint us of the good which might reasonably be expected, neither does nor attempts to do any mischief from which we can have occasion to defend ourselves. There is, however, another virtue of which the observance is not left to the freedom of our own wills, which may be extorted by force and of which the violation exposes to resentment and consequently to punishment. This virtue is justice, 
the violation of justice is injury it does real and positive hurt to some particular persons for motives which are naturally disapproved of it is therefore proper object of resentment and of punishment which is the natural consequence of resentment as mankind goes along with and approve of the violence employed to avenge the hurt which is done by injustice so they much more go along with and approve of that which is employed to prevent and beat off the injury and to restrain the offender from hurting his neighbors the person himself who meditates an injustice is sensible of this and feels that force may with the utmost propriety be made use of both by the person whom he is about to injure and by others either to obstruct the execution of his crime or to punish him when he has executed it and upon this is founded that remarkable distinction between justice and all the other social virtues which has of late been particularly insisted upon by an author of very great and original genius that we feel ourselves to be under a stricter obligation to act according to justice than agreeably to friendship charity or generosity that the practice of these last mentioned virtues seems to be left in some measure to our own choice but that somehow or other we feel ourselves to be in a peculiar manner tied bound and obligated to the observation of justice we feel that is to say that force may with the utmost propriety and with the approbation of all mankind be made use of to constrain us to observe the rules of the one but not to follow the precepts of the other we must always however carefully distinguish what is only blamable or the proper object of his disapprobation from what force may be employed either to punish or to prevent that seems blamable which falls short of that ordinary degree of proper beneficence which experience teaches us to expect of everybody and on the contrary that seems praiseworthy which goes beyond it the ordinary degree itself seems neither blamable nor praiseworthy a father a son a brother who behaves to the correspondent relation neither better nor worse than the greater part of men commonly do seems properly to deserve neither praise nor blame he who surprises us by extraordinary and unexpected though still proper and suitable kindness or on the contrary by extraordinary and unexpected as well as unsuitable unkindness seems praiseworthy in the one case and blamable in the other even the most ordinary degree of kindness or beneficence however cannot among equals be extorted by force among equals each individual is naturally and antecedent to the institution of civil government regarded as having a right both to defend himself from injuries and to exact a certain degree of punishment for those which have been done to him every generous spectator not only approves of his conduct when he does this but enters so far into his sentiments as often to be willing to assist him when one man attacks or robs or attempts to murder another all the neighbors take the alarm and think that they do right when they run either to revenge the person who has been injured or to defend him who is in danger of being so but when a father fails in the ordinary degree of parental affection towards a son when a son seems to want that filial reverence which might be expected to his father when brothers are without the usual degree of brotherly affection when a man shuts his breast against compassion and refuses to relieve the misery of his fellow creatures when he can with the greatest ease in all these cases that everybody blames the conduct nobody imagines that those who might have reason perhaps to expect more kindness have any right to extort it by force the sufferer can only complain and the spectator can intermittable in no other way than by advice and persuasion upon all such occasions for equals to use force against one another would be thought the highest degree of insolence and presumption a superior may indeed sometimes with universal approbation oblige those under his jurisdiction to behave in this respect a superior may indeed sometimes with universal approbation 
obliged those under his jurisdiction to behave in this respect with a certain degree of propriety to one another the laws of all civilized nations oblige parents to maintain their children and children to maintain their parents and impose upon men many other duties of beneficence the civil magistrate is entrusted with the power not only of preserving the public peace by restraining injustice but of promoting the prosperity of the commonwealth by establishing good discipline and by discouraging every sort of vice and impropriety he may prescribe rules therefore which not only prohibit mutual injuries among fellow citizens but command mutual good offices to a certain degree when the sovereign commands what is merely indifferent, and what, antecedent to his orders, might have been omitted without any blame, it becomes not only blamable, but punishable to disobey him. When he commands, therefore, what, antecedent to any such order, could not have been omitted without the greatest blame, it surely becomes much more punishable to be wanting in obedience. Of all the duties of a lawgiver, however, this perhaps is that which it requires the greatest delicacy and reserve to execute with propriety and judgment to neglect it altogether exposes the commonwealth to many gross disorders and shocking enormities and to push it too far is destructive of all liberty security and justice though the mere want of beneficence seems to merit no punishment from equals the greater exertions of that virtue appear to deserve the highest reward by being productive of the greatest good they are the natural and approved objects of the liveliest gratitude though the breach of justice on the contrary exposes to punishment the observance of the rules of that virtue seems scarce to deserve any reward there is no doubt a propriety in the practice of justice and it merits upon that account all the approbation which is due to propriety but as it does no real positive good it is entitled to very little gratitude mere justice is upon most occasions but a negative virtue and only hinders us from hurting our neighbor the man who barely abstains from violating either the person or the estate or the reputation of his neighbors has surely very little positive merit he fulfils however all the rules of what is peculiarly called justice and does everything which his equals can with propriety force him to do or which they can punish him for not doing we may often fulfil all the rules of justice by sitting still and doing nothing as every man doth so shall it be done to him and retaliation seems to be the greatest law which is dictated to us by nature beneficence and generosity we thank due to the generous and beneficent those whose hearts never open to the feelings of humanity should we think be shut out in the same manner from the affections of all their fellow creatures and be allowed to live in the midst of society as in a great desert where there is nobody to care for them or to inquire after them the violator of the laws of justice ought to be made to feel himself that evil which he has done to another and since no regard to the sufferings of his brethren is capable of restraining him he ought to be overawed by the fear of his own the man who is barely innocent who only observes the laws of justice with regard to others and merely abstains from hurting his neighbors can merit only that his neighbors in their turn should respect his innocence and that the same laws should be religiously observed with regard to him. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 Of the Sense of Justice, of Remorse, and of the Consciousness of Merit There can be no proper motive for hurting our neighbor, there can be no incitement to do evil to another which mankind will go along with except just indignation for evil which that other has done to us to disturb his happiness merely because it stands in the way of our own to take from him what is of real use to him merely because it may be of equal or more use to us or to indulge in this manner at the expense of other people 
the natural preference which every man has for his own happiness above that of other people is what no impartial spectator can go along with every man is no doubt by nature first and principally recommended to his own care and as he is fitter to take care of himself than any other person it is fit and right that it should be so every man therefore is much more deeply interested in whatever immediately concerns himself than in what concerns another man and to hear perhaps of the death of another person with whom we have no particular connection will give us less concern will spoil our stomach or break our rest much less than a very insignificant disaster which has befallen ourselves but though the ruin of our neighbour may affect us much less than a very small misfortune of our own we must not ruin him to prevent that small misfortune nor even to prevent our own ruin we must here as in all other cases view ourselves not so much according to that light in which we may naturally appear to ourselves as according to that in which we naturally appear to others so every man may and according to the proverb be the whole world to himself to the rest of mankind he is the most insignificant part of it so his own happiness may be of more importance to him than that of all the world besides to every other person it is of no more consequence than that of any other man though it may be true therefore that every individual in his own breast naturally prefers himself to all mankind yet he dares not look mankind in the face and avow that he acts according to his principle he feels that in this preference they can never go along with him and that how natural soever it may be to him it must always appear excessive and extravagant to them when he views himself in the light in which he is conscious that others will view him he sees that to them he is but one of the multitude in no respect better than any other if he would act so as that the impartial spectator may enter into the principles of his conduct which is what of all things he has the greatest desire to do he must upon this as upon all other occasions humble the arrogance of his self-love and bring it down to something which other men can go along with they will indulge it so far as to allow him to be more anxious about and to pursue with more earnest assiduity his own happiness than that of any other person thus far whenever they place themselves in his situation they will readily go along with him in the race for wealth and honours and preferment he may run as hard as he can and strain every nerve and every muscle in order to outstrip all his competitors but if he should jostle or throw down any of them the indulgence of the spectators is entirely at an end it is a violation of fair play which they cannot admit of this man is to them in every respect as good as he they do not enter into that self-love by which he prefers himself so much to this other and cannot go along with the motive from which he hurt him they readily therefore sympathize with the natural resentment of the injured the offender becomes the object of their hatred and indignation he is sensible that he becomes so and feels that those sentiments are ready to burst out from all sides against him as the greater and more irreparable the evil that is done the resentment of the sufferer runs naturally the higher so does likewise the sympathetic indignation of the spectator as well as the sense of guilt in the agent death is the greatest evil which one man can inflict upon another and excites the highest degree of resentment in those who are immediately connected with the slain murder therefore is the most atrocious of all crimes which affect individuals only in the sight both of mankind and of the person who has committed it to be deprived of that which we are possessed of is a greater evil than to be disappointed of what we have only the expectation breach of property therefore theft and robbery which take from us which we are possessed of 
are greater crimes than breach of contract, which only disappoints us of what we expected. The most sacred laws of justice, therefore, those whose violation seems to call loudest for vengeance and punishment, are the laws which guard the life and person of our neighbor. The next are those which guard his property and possessions, and last of all come those which guard that are called his personal rights, or what is due to him from the promises of others. The violator of the more sacred laws of justice can never reflect on the sentiments which mankind must entertain with regard to him, without feeling all the agonies of shame and horror and consternation. When his passion is gratified, and he begins coolly to reflect on his past conduct, he can enter into none of the motives which influenced it. They appear now as detestable to him as they did always to other people. By sympathizing with the hatred and abhorrence which other men must entertain for him, he becomes in some measure the object of his own hatred and abhorrence. The situation of the person who suffered by his injustice now calls upon his pity. He is grieved at the thought of it, regrets the unhappy effects of his own conduct, and feels at the same time that they have rendered him the proper object of the resentment and indignation of mankind, and of what is the natural consequence of resentment, vengeance, and punishment. The thought of this perpetually haunts him and fills him with terror and amazement. He dares no longer look society in the face, but imagines himself as it were rejected and thrown out from the affections of all mankind. He cannot hope for the consolation of sympathy in this his greatest and most dreadful distress. The remembrance of his crimes has shut out all fellow feeling with him from the hearts of his fellow creatures. The sentiments which they entertain with regard to him are the very thing which he is most afraid of. Everything seems hostile, and he would be glad to fly to some inhospitable desert, where he might never more behold the face of a human creature, nor read in the countenance of mankind the condemnation of his crimes. But solitude is still more dreadful than society. His own thoughts can present him with nothing but what is black, unfortunate, and disastrous, the melancholy foreboding of incomprehensible misery and ruin. The horror of solitude drives him back into society, and he comes again into the presence of mankind, astonished to appear before them, loaded with shame and distracted with fear, in order to supplicate some little protection from the countenance of those very judges, who he knows have already all unanimously condemned him. Such is the nature of that sentiment, which is properly called remorse, of all the sentiments which can enter the human breast, the most dreadful. It is made up of shame from the sense of the impropriety of past conduct, of grief for the effects of it, of pity for those who suffer by it, and of the dread and terror of punishment from the consciousness of the justly provoked resentment of all rational creatures. The opposite behavior naturally inspires the opposite sentiment. The man who, not from frivolous fancy, but from proper motives, has performed a generous action when he looks forward to those whom he has served, feels himself to be the natural object of their love and gratitude, and by sympathy with them, of the esteem and approbation of all mankind, and when he looks backward to the motive from which he acted, and surveys it in the light in which the indifferent spectator will survey it, he still continues to enter into it, and applauds himself by sympathy with the approbation of the supposed impartial judge. In both these points of view, his own conduct appears to him every way agreeable. His mind, at the thought of it, is filled with cheerfulness, serenity, and composure. He is in friendship and harmony with all mankind, and looks upon his fellow creatures with confidence and benevolent satisfaction, secure that he has rendered himself worthy of their most favorable regards.
In the combination of all these sentiments consists the consciousness of merit or of deserved reward. End of section 9